This is the second part to the lecture on the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood and body tissues. This part of the lecture covers the transport of carbon dioxide specifically. Now, carbon dioxide, like oxygen, is transported in forms other than physically dissolved in plasma. But unlike oxygen, carbon dioxide is transported three different ways. Oxygen is transported two different ways. Carbon dioxide is transported physically dissolved in plasma, and about 7% of carbon dioxide is transported that way. Then some of the carbon dioxide uh, combines directly with the hemoglobin molecule and form, forms carbamino hemoglobin. That's about 23%. The majority of carbon dioxide is transported in the blood as bicarbonate, and it's a reaction that takes place within the red blood cell. Now, red blood cells contain an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Now, it doesn't mean that other cells in your body do not have that, because other cells in your body do contain carbonic anhydrase. But the fact that red blood cells contain this enzyme facilitates the reaction that we're about to see. It makes it very quick. Carbon dioxide that's dissolved in plasma will eventually go and come into the red blood cell, which it combines with water to form carbonic acid. Now, that dissociates fairly quickly into bicarbonate, which is a negatively charged ion, and a hydrogen ion. Now, the bicarbonate is transported out of the red blood cell and is transported as bicarbonate inside the plasma. The, in exchange for that negative, negatively charged bicarbonate, which is leaving the cell, a negatively charged chloride enters the cell, and they call this a chloride shift. We, the significance of why we have that happen is to allow to have balance of the membrane potential in the red blood cell membrane. Now, majority of that bicarb is transported in plasma as bicarb, which does serve a role as a very good buffer when we talk about acid-base balance in physiology, too. You may have talked about it a little bit in biochemistry. Now, this is what happens at the level of the tissue. So the tissue, the cells, are producing carbon dioxide. And this is how it's going to be kind of transported in the blood. Now, the carbon dioxide has to be transported up to the lungs. And in the lungs, what's going to happen is because of a gradient, again, CO2 is going to go from the blood into the alveolus. You have the physically dissolved which is just going to cr cross over and go into the alveolus, the carbamino hemoglobin. The carbon dioxide that's bound to the hemoglobin molecule is going to let go and leave the red blood cell, become dissolved in plasma, and eventually leave the alveolus. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. reason why is at the level of the lungs, oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin molecule. And when oxygen binds to the hemoglobin molecule, it causes um, the carbon dioxide that is bound to hemoglobin to release, to release because what happens is the binding of oxygen seems going to seem kind of weird. It's going to make hemoglobin a stronger acid, makes it more acidic. So what does that mean? A strong acid readily gives up a hydrogen ion. And when that happens, it has less tendency to bind to CO2 that forms carbamino hemoglobin. So why is it releasing hydrogen ion? Well, if you look over to the right, what happens is the reaction that we saw earlier is going to go in the reverse direction. Bicarbonate will go enter the red blood cell again, combine with hydrogen ion, form carbonic acid, and then carbonic acid dissociates into CO2 and water. CO2 goes across and eventually goes into the alveolus. Again, this is facilitated by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. So the hydrogen ion, where did the hydrogen ion come, come into play? I failed to mention to you in the previous slide that when you saw this picture, you had the bicarbonate that entered the blood, but I didn't say anything about this hydrogen ion. Well, that hydrogen ion is buffered by hemoglobin. 
Hemoglobin contains a lot of histidine residues. And histidine will bind to hydrogen ions to keep that hydrogen ion from getting into trouble. Well, when you're at the level of the lungs, the binding of oxygen causes a change in the shape of the hemoglobin molecule where that those hydrogen ions that are bound to histidine are going to let go, which then combines with the bicarbonate, forming the carbonic acid, and then that dissociates into CO2 and water. So you see just the reversed reaction. Now, one thing that is significant about CO2 transport in the blood is something that is referred to as the Haldane effect. Now, you have a, a diagram in your notes that's trying to depict the Haldane effect. I actually really dislike that diagram, so I'm going to tell you in a nutshell what the Haldane effect has to do with. Haldane effect specifically refers to the effect of oxygen binding to hemoglobin and its effect on CO2 transport. So at the level of the lungs, if oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for CO2. So it allows you to release CO2 at the level of the lungs. At the level of the tissues, when hemoglobin lets go of, of oxygen, you have deoxyhemoglobin. Well, deoxyhemoglobin can bind to a lot more carbon dioxide than oxygenated hemoglobin, which definitely, definitely facilitates the transport of CO2. So at the level of the tissue, when you're releasing the oxygen, the hemoglobin can bind to a lot more CO2. And the Haldane effect, because of this change in the configuration of the hemoglobin molecule, due to oxygen binding, it pretty much, they say, it, it doubles the amount of carbon dioxide that we actually can transport in the blood, which quantitatively is way more significant in CO2 transport than the Bohr effect was in oxygen transport. So remember, the Bohr effect was the effect of carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions on the ability of hemoglobin to bind to oxygen. The Haldane effect is the, the effect of oxygen binding to hemoglobin on the ability to transport CO2. And this is considered to be a lot more significant in CO2 transport than that Bohr effect is in oxygen transport. Now, when you look at CO2 transport in the blood, because of that reaction that we show, showed you with carbon dioxide combining with water, which you see down here again, that forms the, and actually this is a typo that shouldn't be in minus right here, bicarbonate that dissociates into, um, or this is carbonic acid, sorry, this dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Because of this going on in the blood, venous blood, you'll notice, has a lower pH. Now, your notes may be slightly different than this. They're, the pH in the venous blood is lower than the pH in arterial blood, and it has to come down to carbon dioxide transport. When CO, when CO2 combines with that water and eventually becomes bicarbonate, it releases these hydrogen ions, which lowers the pH. So venous blood pH is lower than arterial blood. It all comes down to CO2 transport. One of the things that we're going to be looking at next trimester is the effects of breathing on plasma pH. If you hyperventilate, if you do a lot of hyperventilation, some people getting anxious, have anxiety, they hyperventilate, they're going to blow off a lot of carbon dioxide. And what happens is, since they're blowing off all the CO2, this reaction is going right to left. Bicarbonate combines with hydrogen ions, and we go in this direction, you're lowering, lowering the levels of hydrogen ions in the blood, which causes the pH of the blood to increase, and it could lead to what we call respiratory alkalosis. Now, if you hypoventilate, maybe brainstem injury or certain drugs can suppress breathing, the reverse happens. You're going to be retaining carbon dioxide, and as a result, you're going to be going left to right. And if you have a lot more hydrogen ions in the blood, 
that's going to decrease the pH of the blood and it could lead to respiratory acidosis. But what we could also look at is if we have a acid-base disorder that is due to changes in metabolism, such as like or um, if you're diabetic and you're not taking your insulin, what can happen is they start producing a lot of ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are weak acids. All they dissociate at physiologic pH, you get a lot of hydrogen ions, and it can lead to what we call metabolic acidosis. The way, one of the ways that our bodies compensate for that is the use of the bicarbonate buffer system, because we have a lot of bicarbonate in our blood, is the bicarbonate combined with those excess hydrogen ions, and it's a very quick protection for the tissues from that acidic pH and it's going to transport it in the blood and one of the ways we can get rid of it is to increase our breathing. So if we increase our breathing rate we can get rid of that CO2 and essentially you're getting rid of hydrogen ions. So that's something that we're going to might be, be talking about next trimester. Now the very last topic that I want to mention, it comes down to CO2 and oxygen, is something called a respiratory exchange ratio or a respiratory quotient. They're slightly different, but under normal conditions, the, the values that we get are, are equal. So I'm going to differentiate between the two. The respiratory exchange ratio refers to the gas exchange that you have in the lungs. The, it's between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli, and that refers to being external respiration. The amount of oxygen that's coming in in exchange for the CO2 going out, there's, there's going to be you know, a certain ratio to it. At the level of the tissues, that is referred to as the respiratory quotient. So this is the gas exchange between the systemic capillaries and the cells, and they're referred to as being internal respiration. Now here we're talking about oxygen being consumed by the, the cells and the CO2 being produced. Under normal circumstances, we produce or we consume about 250 mils of oxygen. And we produce about 200 mils of oxygen. And so you get this ratio or a quotient. Now the values that we get do depend on what kind of diets that you take. If the value that we're giving you for this carbon dioxide output versus oxygen uptake is about 0.825 if you have a mixed diet. So you're having carbs and proteins and lipids. If you have a straight carb diet or a straight protein diet or a straight lipid diet, the values will be different. The reason is, we'll give you an example, is like if you consume only lipids, you form more water than carbon dioxide. So less CO2 is, is produced, so that's why that ratio is less. When you use carbs, if you just remember the, the glycolysis in the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA in the TCA cycle, you know in those parts where you're producing CO2. Now these values come into play when they measure something called your basal metabolic rate. So knowing that is something that is utilized when someone's trying to determine your, your basal metabolic rate. So that's why I want to mention it to you. We're going to talk about it a little bit more um, next trimester in Physiology 2. So I just want to introduce you to this concept. So it has to do with carbon dioxide um, and oxygen exchange. And we tend to consume a little bit more oxygen than we produce CO2. And it comes into play. Um, in determining basal metabolic rate, but also it's very good to look at when you're thinking about certain conditions, such as if it's been like four or five hours after I've eaten, what is your body going to be using predominantly for energy? So you've used all the, the stuff that you ate from your last meal, you started having to use certain forms of energy more than others, and when you're about four or five, even six, seven, eight hours after your last meal, you're going to use predominantly lipids. And so that respiratory exchange ratio or respiratory quotient is going to be closer to this 0.7.
So I'm just that would be an example. So this is the end of this lecture on gas transport. So uh, we will do uh, something in class that will allow us to utilize some of this information.